Okay, I am back. I'm going to pick up right where I left off. I had just read item 7, the testimony from the tradition of the church, and I'm starting a new chapter, chapter 2, Christ's True Humanity. Chapter 2, Christ's True Humanity. <clears throat> item 8, the reality of Christ's human nature. One, heretical teaching. About the end of the first and the beginning of the second century, heresies emerged which denied the reality of Christ's human body and stigmatized, <clears throat> excuse me, stigmatized as fantasy the facts of Christ's early earthly life, especially his suffering and death. And there's a reference given here to St. Ignatius. Christ, it was claimed, quote, had only apparently suffered, end quote. So I'm sure Christ, um, I'm sure St. Ignatius is defending against that heresy. The point of departure of this docetism, as the heresy was called, was, according to the letters of St. Ignatius, the scandal of the cross. You can see Ephesians 18.1 and compare Galatians 5.11 and 1 Corinthians 1.23. The later Gnostic sects, which either attributed to Christ an apparent body without any reality, see for example Basilides and Marcion, or a heavenly astral body, see Apelles or Valentin, proceeded from Gnostic dualism, according to which a union of the divine Logos with a human body is not possible, since all material things were regarded not as creatures of God, but as proceeding from a primeval principle of evil. This Gnostic dualism was also the source of the docetic errors of the Manichaeans and of the Priscillianists. 2. The Teaching of the Church and here we have a dogma. Christ assumed a real body, not an apparent body. And this is a de fide dogma. Christ assumed a real body, not an apparent body. The oldest symbols of faith mention the most important facts of the earthly life of Jesus. That is, his conception, birth, suffering, dying, and resurrection. Using the words in their natural sense and thereby exclude the docetic docetic denial of the re reality of Christ's human nature. Compare the Apostles' Creed and the later symbols which depend on it. The Council of Chalcedon, 451, calls Christ, quote, truly God and truly man, end quote. Docetism, which continued in Manichaeanism, was condemned in medieval times in the, quote, profession of faith of Michael Paleologus, End quote, of the Second General Council of Lyon, 1274, and in the Docretum Pro Jacobitis of the General Council of Florence in 1441. Number three, proof from the New Testament and tradition. The evangelists describe the facts of the earthly life of Jesus in such a fashion that one cannot doubt the reality of his body and of his soul and of their specific similarity to the body and to the soul of other men. After the resurrection, Jesus assures the doubting disciples of the reality of his human body with the words, quote, handle and see, end quote, Luke 24, 39. The apostle St. John designates the act of becoming man as becoming flesh, John 1, 14, and combats false teachers who deny the coming of Christ in the flesh, 1, 1 John 4, 2, 2 John 7, and compare 1 John 1, 1. St. Paul, speaking of Christ as the mediator, calls him the man Jesus Christ. See Romans 5, 15, 1 Corinthians 15, 21, and 1 Timothy 2, 5, and points to the human origin of Christ. Romans 1, 3, 9, 5, 2, Tim, 2 Timothy 2, 8, and Galatians 3, 16, and 4, 4, as well as to his suffering and death on the cross. 1 Corinthians 1, 23 says, quote, we preach Christ crucified, end quote. 
Docetism was refuted first by St. Ignatius of Antioch, who died in around 107 AD, and later by St. Irenaeus, who died in around 202, and Tertullian, who died in 220, especially in their arguments against the Gnostics. In the refutation of Docetism, St. Ignatius takes his stand on the authority of the Gospel. And the reference is given there. He cites the therein reported facts of Jesus' human life and emphasizes them with a forceful alithos, meaning truly, really. So he, he uh, emphasizes forcefully with the, the word alithos, truly, really. As I mentioned in an earlier episode, aletheia is truth, alithos is truly, in a true manner, I guess. <clears throat> As the Fathers stress, docetism is particularly baneful for the Christian striving after virtue, since it leads to the devaluation of the suffering and death of Christ and his redemption. It leads to the undermining of the credibility of Holy Writ, and consequently of the whole Christian faith, and it nullifies the doctrine of the Eucharist. Dangerous, dangerous heresy. Item 9. The Integrity of Christ's Human Nature 1. Heretical Teaching, Arianism and Apollinarianism Arius, who died in 336, taught that the Logos, the Word, had no human soul, but only a soulless body united with himself. He held that the Logos substituted for Christ's soul. He believed that in this way he could prove that the Logos was a creature. <clears throat> Apollinaris of Laodicea, who died about 390, a zealous defender of the Nicene Creed, under the influence of the Platonic trichotomism, synthesis of the human being out of flesh, soul, and spirit, taught that the divine Logos had assumed a human body and an animal soul. The Divine Logos had, he asserted, taken the place of the missing spiritual soul. He erroneously believed that only in this manner could the unity of person and the sinlessness of Christ be preserved. He sought a positive foundation for his theory in John 1.14 and Philippians 2.7. So in John 1.14... We have sarx, or the body, and in Philippians 2.7 we have omioma, similarity. Omioma. Two, the teaching of the church, and here we have a dogma. Christ assumed not only a body, but also a rational soul. This is a defide dogma. Christ assumed not only a body, but a rational soul also. Apollinarianism, which was condemned at a particular synod at Alexandria under the presidency of St. Athanasius in 362, was rejected as heretical at the Second General Council at Constantinople in 381, and at a Roman synod under Pope Damasus in 382. The Council of Chalcedon, 451, teaches concerning Christ's humanity, quote, he is perfect according to humanity, a true man consisting of a rational soul and a body. He is identical in substance with us in according to his humanity. End quote. In conformity with the decision of Chalcedon, the creed quicumque confesses Perfectus homo ex anima rationa rationali et humana carne subsistens. The General Council of Vienne, 1311 to 1312, declared against Petrus Joannis Olivi, who died in 1298, that as in all other men, so also in Christ, the rational soul is in itself and essentially the form of the body. In itself and essentially is rendered in Latin per se et essentialer, essentialiter.
Number three, proof from the sources of faith. Jesus himself speaks of his human soul. Compare Matthew 26, 38, where he says, quote, My soul is sorrowful even unto death, end quote. And Luke 23, 46 says, quote, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit, end quote. Holy Writ designates Jesus' death as the, quote, giving up of the ghost, end quote. References are given there. The spirituality of Christ's soul is especially manifested in his prayer of appeal and thanksgiving, as well as in the subordination of his human will to the divine will, where he says, for example, quote, not my will, but thine, end quote. Luke 22, 42. St. Clement of Rome refers to both constituent parts of Christ's human nature when he says that Jesus Christ, quote, has given his flesh for our flesh and his soul for our soul, end quote. And then he has a work uh, cited there. St. Ignatius of Antioch calls Christ a, quote, perfect man, end quote. Teleos Anthropos. And the reference is given. The most important of the early opponents of Apollinaris of Laodicea was St. Gregory of Nyssa. The fathers and theologians established the necessity of the assumption of a rational soul by Christ on two axioms. That which is not assumed has not been saved. And the word assumed flesh through the medium of the soul. In connection with the defense against Apollinarianism, the formula developed. In Christ, there are two natures, divinity and humanity, and, th and three substances, logos, rational soul, and body. However, this formula was later reprobated by the Provincial Council of Frankfurt in 794 on account of the factual identity of nature and substance. In spite of this, however, it gained an entry into schol scholastic theology. See Hugo of St. Victor. Christ is one with one personality, two natures, and three constituents, divinity, flesh, and soul. And uh, some references are given there. Item 10, the Adamite origin of Christ's human nature. And here we have a dogma. Christ was truly generated and born of a daughter of Adam, the Virgin Mary. This is a de fide dogma. Christ was truly generated and born of a daughter of Adam, the Virgin Mary. The reality and integrity of Christ's human nature is especially guaranteed by the fact that Christ was truly generated and born of a human mother. Through his descent from a daughter of Adam, he was as to his humanity, incorporated into the posterity of Adam. He had identity of essence with man and community of race. Christ became our brother. While individual Gnostics such as Valentin and Apelles, relying upon 1 Corinthians 15, 47, I hope that's what that says, and Matthew 1, 20, asserted that Christ had descended from heaven to earth in a spirit form body and had gone through the virgin without appropriating anything from her, quote, just as the water flows through a canal, end quote, Epiphanius, and the reference is given. The church in her symbols of faith teaches that Christ was generated and born of the Virgin Mary, that is, out of the substance of the Virgin Mary. That's why I always say that it's uh, Christ's heart is Mary's heart and Christ's blood is Mary's blood. Christ's flesh is Mary's flesh. The, the Apostles' Creed, Netus ex Maria Virgine, Virgine the Creed cum, cum, quicumque ex substantia matris in seculo natus, in both the Old and the New Testaments, the Messiah is designated as of the posterity of Abraham and of David. References are given there. The New Testament explicitly stresses the true motherhood of Mary. Compare Matthew 1.16, which says, Mary, quote, of whom was born Jesus, end quote. Luke 1.31 says, quote, Behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb, and shalt bring forth a son, end quote. And Galatians 4.4 4 says, quote, made of a woman, end quote. Among the fathers, St. Ignatius of Antioch in particular emphasizes that Christ, 
quote, is truly of the race of David according to the flesh, that he was truly born of a virgin. End quote, and the reference is given there. Against the Gnostics, the fathers used the proposition X, not pair, in Matthew 1.16, Galatians 4.4, 4, and Luke 1.35, in the last passage and addition. And some references are given there of Tertullian. In, uh, sorry, the importance as regards salvation of the true and complete humanity of Christ and of his community of race with us lies, on the one hand, in the deed of atonement on the cross, which he, as our brother, has performed on our behalf. And on the other hand, in the ideal picture of noble humanity, which he afforded us in his moral life. See the doctrine of the redemption. Moving on now to chapter 3, the union of his two natures in the one person, Christ. Item 11, Christ is one person. 1. The heresy of Nestorianism. The false teaching of Nestorius, 428 Patriarch of Constantinople, Constantinople died about 451 in exile, to which the, true, the two heads of the Antioch school of exegetics, Diodorus of Tarsus, who died before 394, and his pupil Theodore of Mopsuestia, who died in 428, had subscribed, may from its refutation <clears throat> be summarized under the following principal heads. Its refutation, by the way, was by St. Cyril of Alexandria and St. John Cassian in particular. A. The Son of the Virgin Mary is not the same person as the Son of God. Okay, this is the fault. These are the false teachings being enumerated here. A. The Son of the Virgin Mary is not the same person as the Son of God. And in Greek, we have aloke alos, other and other. In Christ, there are corresponding to the two natures, also two subjects or persons. This is what Nestorius teaches. B, the two persons are connected with each other by a mere accidental or moral unity. In Greek, we have enosis Schechti and Sinafia, Sinafeia. Sinafeia. The man Christ is not God, but a bearer of God, Theophoros. The incarnation does not mean that God the Son became man, but, be, but merely that the divine logos resided in the man in the same manner as God dwells in the just. C. The human activities, birth, suffering, death, may be asserted of the man, Christ, only. The divine activities, creation, omnipotence, eternity of the God logos, only. That is, denial of the communicatio idiomatum communication of idioms. D. Consequently, Mary cannot in the proper sense be designated by the title, customary since the time of origin, of, quote, Mother of God, end quote, Theotokos. She is merely a bearer of man, Anthropotokos, or Mother of Christ, Christotokos. E. The conviction that in Christ there are two persons appears also in the doctrine of authentication, peculiar to the Antiochians, according to which the man, Christ, was obliged to merit divine dignity and adoration by his obedience in suffering. Nestorianizing tendencies appeared in the Christology of early scholasticism also. Above all, in the habitus theory, which goes back to Peter, Lo <coughs> Peter Abelard, and which was favored by Peter Lombard, Petrus Lombardus, which compares the assumption of human nature by the divine logos to the putting on of a garment. St. Thomas condemns this as heresy since it implies a mere accidental unification. See the reference to the Summa there. The teaching of Antar Gunther, Anton Gunther, who died in 1863, also merges into Nestorianism from his philosophical concept that the essence of personality lies in self-consciousness, there results in the field of Christology the conclusion that in Christ, who has a truly divine and truly human self-consciousness, there are two different persons, 
a divine and a human. In order to evade this conclusion, Gunther assumed a, quote, formal unity, unquote, between the eternal Son of God and the Son of the Virgin, which consists in the mutual penetration of the self-consciousness. However, the dogma teaches that there is only one person. Two, the teaching of the Church. And here we have a dogma. The divine and the human natures are united hypostatically in Christ, that is, joined to each other in one person. This is a defide dogma. The divine and the human natures are united hypostatically in Christ, that is, joined to each other in one person. The dogma asserts that there is in Christ a person, who is the divine person of Logos, and two natures which belong to the one divine person. The human nature is assumed into the unity and dominion of the divine person so that the divine person operates in the human nature and through the human nature as its organ, as its organ. The third general council of Ephesus, 431, confirmed the 12 anathematisms of St. Cyril of Alexandria, but did not formally define them. They were later recognized by popes and councils as an authentic expression of Catholic doctrine. Their main content may be summarized as follows. A. Christ incarnate is a single, that is, a soul person. He is God and man at the same time. B. The God Logos is connected with the flesh by an inner physical or substantial unification. Christ is not the bearer of God, but is God really so the physical or substantial unification is rendered in Greek as enosis physiki or enosis kathipostasin. kathipostasin. See, the human and the divine activities predicated of Christ in Holy Writ and in the Fathers may not be, may not be divided between two persons or hypostases, the man Christ and the God Logos, but must be attributed to the one Christ, the Logos become flesh. It is the divine Logos who suffered in the flesh, was crucified, died, and rose again. The Holy Virgin is the mother of God, Theotokos, since she truly bore the God Logos become flesh. The Council of Chalcedon, 451, declared that the two natures of Christ are joined, quote, in one person and one hypostasis, end quote, rendered in Greek, is and prosopon, I think that's, I think they misspelled prosopon there because you can't pronounce P-R-S altogether, pros, must be prosopon, ke mia hypostasin. Saint Cyril uses the expression rendered in Greek here, enosis kathipostasis, uh, ipostasin, but still understands ipostasis in the sense of usia, essential, essentiality or substance. With this, he designates the unification as a substantial one in opposition to the accidental unification of the Nestorians. The Council of Chalcedon, Chalcedon does not use the term hypostatic union, rendered in Greek, enosis kathipostasin. This phrase, the hypostatic union, was only adopted by the Fifth General Council of Constantinople in 553 against the Nestorian heresy of two persons in Christ and against the monophysite heresy of one nature as an adequate expression of Catholic doctrine of the union of the two natures in the one divine personality of Christ. Council stated, quote, If anyone does not confess that the word of God was united with the flesh in the hypostasis, and that for this reason there is only one person and one hypostasis, let him be anathema. And the Greek word they used for hypostasis was kathipostasin. I'll let you read the Latin there. Three, proof from the sources of faith. A, teaching of Holy Scripture. The Catholic doctrine is contained in Holy Writ, though it does not contain the term hypostatic union. 
Scripture attests that Christ is true God and true man. To the one Christ are attributed two series of predicates, one divine and one human. Since the attributes of both natures, omnipotence, eternity, nations, crucifixion, death, are attributed to him, <clears throat> it follows that the two natures must belong to one and the same subject. The oneness of Christ's personality is particularly clear in those passages where his human characteristics are predicated of his person under the title of God, and his divine characteristics predicated of his person designated according to his human nature. And we, hear, we have that communicatio idiomatum. And the biblical references are given there. <clears throat> Since God's immutability excludes the possibility of a transformation of his divine nature into his human nature, the incarnation of the Logos in John 1.14 can be understood only as signifying that the divine Logos became man without ceasing to be God. The Logos, therefore, after the incarnation, possesses not only the divine but also, the, but also a human nature, that is, he is a God-man. According to Philippians 2, 6 and following, the same Christ who was in the figure of God and was equal to God took the form of a servant and became like unto man. This kenosis, or emptying, on account of the absolute immutability of God cannot be understood as a renunciation of the divine nature, but only as a renunciation in his human nature of the divine glory, or doxa in Greek. To the divine nature which he retained, he added the human nature. Menon o in eleven. Eleven o uk in. References given to St. John Chrysostom, you can look that up. The Christ who appeared in the form of a servant is therefore a divine person who possesses the divine as well as a human nature. <clears throat> B. The testimony of tradition. The Fathers appeal to the Church symbols of faith, in which it is said of the same Jesus Christ that he is the Son of God and that he was born of the Virgin Mary. The symbols of the Oriental Church especially stress the unity of Christ. <clears throat> and here we have in Greek, Pistevomen is ena kyrion, Iisun Christon. The fathers before the Council of Ephesus attest their faith in the hypostatic union by predicating of Christ the, uh, by predicating of Christ divine and human characteristics and activities, frequently interchanging the predicates and thus combating the attempt to divide Christ into two subjects, alos ke alos in Greek, or into two sons, son of God, son of man. Compare St. Ignatius of Antioch and the references are given there. St. Gregory of Nazianzus. St. <clears throat> Gregory of Nazianzus, 423 to 430, points out that the relationship of nature and person in Christ is to be conceived conversely from that which obtains in the Trinity. He says, quote, To put it briefly, the Savior unites in himself two different things, alo ke alo, but not two different persons, far from it, uk alos Veke alos. And then we have this word here, megenito, 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 megenito. Hard to pronounce that one. I say different things, the opposite to the case of the Trinity. For in that case, we have distinct persons, since we may not mix the hypostases, but not distinct things. Okay, so he says, I say different things, the opposite to the case of the Trinity, for in that case we have distinct persons, since we may, since we may not mix the hypostases, but not distinct things, for the three are one and the same in the Godhead, end quote. So I say, Different thing, diff I say different things, but not distinct things. So let me read that whole quote again from St. Gregory of Nazianzus. He says, quote, To put it briefly, the Savior unites in himself two different things, two different things, but not two different persons, far from it. I say different things, the opposite to the case of the Trinity, for in that case we have, a dis we have distinct persons, since we may not mix the hypostases, 
but not distinct things, for the three are one and the same in the Godhead. End quote. The Latin fathers, principally under the influence of Tertullian, came earlier than the Greek to a clear Trinitarian and Christological terminology. Compare Tertullian and the references given there. We behold a double state nature, not mixed with one another, but joined in the one person, Jesus, God, and man. St. Augustine, in his work cited here, talks about in unity of person joining both natures. And in the Enchiridion, he says, in the unity of his person, there accrued to the word a rational soul and a body. In their speculative reputa refutation of the Nestorian heresy, the fathers point out the fatal consequences of the fundamental Nestorian errors, especially in the doctrine of the redemption and in the doctrine of the Eucharist. Thus, Christ's passion as the work of a mere man would be deprived of its infinite value, and this infinite value is a necessary prepossession, presupposition of the, of the redemption. And again, the flesh, and again, the flesh of Christ in the Eucharist is not life-giving if it be not the very flesh of the God Logos. In the conflict with the Nestorian, St. Cyril of Alexandria makes frequent use of the easily misunderstood formula, quote, an incarnate nature of the God Logos, end quote, rendered in Greek, mia physis tu theiu logosesarkomeni, logosesarkomeni. Logos sarcomeni. Logos taking flesh, I guess, because sarx is flesh and logos is this another word. In this context, he understood by nature, just as did his opponents, the nature existing in itself, meaning hypostasis. St. Cyril erroneously thought that the formula had the authority of St. Athanasius. In reality, it goes back to the confession of faith made by Apollinaris of Laodicea to the Emperor Jovian, quote, on the incarnation of the God Logos, end quote, which was publicized under the name of St. Athanasius. The Fourth General Council of Constantinople adopted the formula. Item 12, the duality of the natures. One, the heresy of monophysitism. In the struggle against Nestorianism, Eutyches, Archimandrite of Constantinople, of Constantinople, and his adherents, principally Alexandrians, Patriarch Dioscor, went to the other extreme, misinterpreting some phrases of St. Cyril, and also some older phrases. They posited in Christ not only one person, but also only one single nature. They taught that Christ is indeed out of two natures, but not in two natures. So we had some Greek that I skipped here. It was enosis physici, mia physis to theu logu cesa, what's that? Cesar gomene. And then another older phrase here was listed as Crassis mixis, or mixtio mixtura in Latin. And then the one single nature is rendered in Greek as monifisis. In their explanation of the mode and the manner of unification of the Godhead and the humanity, they diverged. Some assumed a transformation of the human nature into the divine nature, or as an absorption of human nature in the divine nature. In Greek we have enosis kataliosin kat, enosis kataliosin or in Latin conversio. Others a confusion or mixture of the two natures into one new third nature. In Greek enosis kata sig Sin, sig sin, or in Latin confusio. 
others a composition of the two natures after the fashion of the unification of the body and soul in man. Rendered in Greek, ennosis kata synthesin, or in Latin, composito, uh, composi compositio. This last was the view of Severus of Antioch. Two, the teaching of the church. And here we have a dogma. In the hypostatic union, each of the two natures of Christ continues unimpaired, untransformed, and unmixed with the other. It's a de fide dogma. In the hypostatic union, each of the two natures of Christ continues unimpaired, untransformed, and unmixed with the other. So it's interesting they used mono, a lot of the terminology of monophysitism to define this dogma very clearly. The Catholic doctrine of faith found its classical expression in the famous Epistola Dogmatica of Pope Leo I to the Patriarch Flavian of Constantinople, 449, which was solemnly confirmed by the Fourth General Council of Chalcedon. In 451. This council, in agreement with the Epistola Dogmatica of Leo I and the formulations of Saint Cyril, defined as follows, quote, We teach that one and the same Christ, the Son, the Lord, the Only Begotten, is to be recognized in two natures, Theo and Physicin, unmixed, transformed, Asichitos Atrepto, against monophysitism, against monophysitism, undivided, unseparated, adioretos, adioretos, ahoristos, against Nestorianism. The difference of the natures in consequence of the unification being in no way abrogated and the properties, in Latin proprietos, of each of the two natures remaining completely undisturbed. That's the end of that citation. The last words are, are taken over from the Epistola Dogmatica of Pope Leo. Three, proof from the sources of faith. According to the testimony of Holy Writ, Christ is true God and true man, that is, possessor of the unimpaired divine nature and, and, and an unimpaired human nature. Compare John 1.14 and Philippians 2.6 and following. Especially deserving of mention among the traditional witnesses is Tertullian, who long before the Council of Chalcedon attested the unimpaired continuance of the two natures in classical words. He says in his work, which is cited, quote, the identity of each of the suit of each of the two substances remained intact so that the spirit performed his works in him that is miracles and signs as also the flesh underwent sufferings as both substances each in its own condition of being acted in distinct ways each performed the feats and achieved the successes peculiar to it end quote namely, on the one hand, miracles, on the other hand, sufferings. Pope Leo I had recourse to the formulations of Tert Tertullian. Compare St. Ambrose, his work on the faith. Reference is given. The fathers also point out the intrinsic impossibility of the monophysite doctrine of unification. It contradicts the absolute immutability and the infinite perfection of God, and by abrogating the true humanity of Christ, leads to the destruction of the work of redemption. Thirteen, item 13. The duality of wills and modes of operation in Christ. Number one, the heresy of monothelitism. <clears throat> monothelitism is an offshoot of monophysitism. In order to win back the Monophysites, the Patriarch, Patriarch Sergius of Constantinople, 610 to 638, suggested the unifying formula. In Christ, there are indeed two natures, but only one will, namely the divine will, and one mode of activity. So in Greek, we have enthelima ke mia energia, 
So if you've ever studied Satanism, uh, you'll know the law of Thelema. Here we have this word, Thelema. It's the Greek word for the will. Right? So, do what thou wilt shall be the whole of the law. That was taken, but that was taken from St. Augustine. It's a perversion of what an abrogation of what, uh, Christ, uh, not Christ, but what St. Augustine said. St. Augustine said, love God and do what thou wilt. And Aleister Crowley took it and just removed the love God part and just said, do what thou wilt. It'll be the whole of the law. But it's not the whole of the law. It's missing the love of God. Right? In this view, the human nature of Christ becomes an instrument without a will of its own in the hand of the divine Logos. The most prominent opponents of this error and protagonists in defense of the true doctrine of the church were St. Sophronius from 634, Patriarch of Jerusalem, and St. Maximus, confessor, who died in 662. Two, the teaching of the church. And here we have a dogma. Each of the two natures in Christ possesses its own natural will and its own natural mode of operation. This is a defide dogma. Each of the two natures in Christ possesses its own natural will and its own natural mode of operation. In spite of the real duality of the wills, a moral unity subsisted and subsists because Christ's human will is, in the most perfect fashion, in harmony with and in free subordination to the divine will. Yeah, well, that's how we're supposed to uh, imitate Christ in that way too, right? We have a will, but we're supposed to, in the most perfect fashion, in harmony with and be in harmony with and in free subordination to the divine will. Monothelitism was rejected by the church and the Lateran Synod of the year 649 under Pope Martin I in the Epistola Dogmatica ad Imperatores of Pope Agatho and at the Sixth General Council of Constantinople. The last name completed the Chalcedon, Chalcedon decision of faith by the addition, quote, Similarly, we promulgate according to the teaching of the Holy Fathers that in him are also two natural wills and two natural modes of working, unseparated, untransformed, undivided, unmixed, and these two natural wills are not opposed to each other, as the impious heretics maintained. That's the end of that citation. From the dogma that Christ possesses a true human will, there emerges as a theological conclusion that Christ's human will is free. The libertas contrarietatis, that is, a freedom to choose between good and evil, must, however, be denied, because he, as a divine person, cannot be the subject of sin. So Christ could not choose between good and evil. He's above that. True, free true freedom is not choosing between good and evil. True freedom of the will is choosing to do to do or not to do, or to do this or to do that, right? As outlined in an earlier episode, you can go and brush up on that if you want. Three, proof from the sources of faith. A, according to the testimony of Holy Writ, Christ expressly distinguishes his human will from the divine will, which he possesses in common with the Father. But at the same time, Christ stresses the complete subordination of his human will to his divine will. Matthew 26, 39 says, quote, Not as I will but as thou wilt, end quote. Luke twenty two forty two 42 says, quote, not my will, but thine be done, end quote. John six thirty eight says, quote, I came down from heaven not to do my will, but the will of him that sent me, end quote. Christ's relationship of obedience with the heavenly father, often stressed in Holy Writ, presupposes a human will. Tons of references given there, you look those up at your leisure. The freedom of choice possessed by Christ's human will is expressed in John 10, 18, which says, quote, I lay down my life of myself, meaning freely or voluntarily, and I have the power to lay it down, and I have the power to take it up again, end quote. Compare Isaiah 53, 7, which says, quote, He was offered because it was his own will, end quote. 
The Father's conception is already expressed in the rejection of Apollinarianism and of Monophysitism. In regard to Matthew 26.39, St. Athanasius expressly teaches the natural duality of the wills of Christ, saying, quote, He announces two wills here, the human, which is an affair of the flesh, and the divine, which is the affair of God. The human will, on account of the weakness of the flesh, prays for the aversion of suffering, but the divine will welcomes it. End quote. Powerful stuff. And the reference is given there to St. Athanasius's quote that I just read. Pope Leo the Great stresses the two different modes of operation in his Epistola Dogmatica when he says, quote, each of the two forms, meaning nature, operates in communion with the other, that which is peculiar to it, end quote. The scholastic theologians disting distinguish in Christ's human will the voluntas rationis or spiritus, that is, the spiritual will which subordinates itself to the divine will, and the voluntas carnis or sensual will, that is, the sensual desire which strove against suffering. Accordingly, they speak of Christ's two human wills. Many, with Saint Hugo of Saint Victor, Add to this the voluntas pietatis, that is, the will of compassion, which feels for the suffering of others, and speaks of four wills in Christ. Compare Hugo's treatise De Quatuor Voluntatibus in Christo. The Fathers speculatively derive the doctrine of the two wills and modes of activity in Christ from the integrity of the two natures, and base it on the principle that no nature is without activity. Compare St. John, John of Damascus, and the work is given there if you want to look it up. They recall the axiom which is valid for the doctrine of the Trinity and for Christology, that the number of the wills and modes of activity follow the number of the natures, not of the hypostases. Appendix. The God-human or theandric activities. The expression God-human activity, rendered in Greek, Energia Weandriki, uh, Weandriki, Andriki must be like uh, and Andriki. That must be Theandriki. Yeah, I think that's what that must be. Energia Theandriki. I think that's what it says. Operatio. De Virile, in Latin, goes back to Pseudo-Dionysius the Areopagite, about 580. The Severianians, the Severianians, the Severianians moderate monophysites. Okay, the Severian, the, the Severianians, moderate monophysites, taught a single God-human mode of operation. Corresponding to God, uh, corresponding to Christ's nature, compounded of the Godhead and a human nature, the monoenergetics also spoke of a single mode of activity of Christ, which they conceived as being achieved by the divine nature by the utilization of a purely passive human nature possessed of no human will. The Orthodox theologians of the seventh century took over the expression and purified it. The Max, Saint Maximus the Confessor and the Lateran Synod of the year 649 expressly clarified it in view of the heretical misinterpretation. According to Saint Maximus, three distinct kinds of activity can be distinguished in Christ. A. The divine or purely divine activities, which the Logos as Principium Quod, in common with the Father and with the Holy Ghost, operates through the divine nature as principium quo. I guess it's principium, I think that's how you say it. So the divine or the purely divine activities, which are the Logos as principium quod, in common with the Father and with the Holy Ghost, operates through the divine nature as principium quo. For example, the creation, preservation and government of the world. For example, the creation, preservation and government of the world. I think I should read that again. The divine or the a the divine or the purely divine activities, which the logos as principium quod, 
in common with the Father and with the Holy Ghost, operates through the divine nature as principium quo, for example, the creation, the preservation, and government of the world. B, the human activities which the Logos operates as principium quod through the human nature as principium quo, for example, seeing, hearing, eating, drinking, suffering, and dying. Insofar as these activities are human acts of a divine person, they can, in the wider sense, be designated God, human, or theandric. C, the, the mixed activities which the Logos as principium quod operates through the divine nature in such a fashion, however, that at the same time he uses the human nature as instrument, rendered in Latin instrumentum coniunctum. For example, the miraculous healing of the sick by physical touch or by a mere word. Closely considered, the mixed activities emerge as two distinct activities, one divine and one human, through which a joint operation is affected. Activities of this kind are designated God-human activities in the proper and narrower sense. The expressions caro deificata, rendered in Greek sarx theothesa, or theotheisa, and in Latin voluntas deificata, oh, <clears throat> sorry, and the second one, voluntas deificata, rendered in Greek thelima theothen, do not assert a transformation of the human nature into the divine nature or of the human will into the divine will, nor a conmixture of both, but simply the assumption of the human nature and of the human will by the hypostasis of the God Logos. The question of Horonius. There is no doubt but that Pope Horonius I who reigned from 625 to 638, was personally orthodox. There's no doubt about that. However, through his prohibition against speaking of two modes of operation, he unwittingly favored the monothelite error. The Sixth General Council wrongly condemned him as a heretic. I agree. Pope Leo II, who reigned from 682 to 683, confirmed his anathematization, but not for the reason given by the Council. He did not reproach him with heresy, but with negligence in the suppression of the error. I agree. Item 14. The beginning and duration of the hypostatic union. 1. The beginning of the hypostatic union. And here we have a dogma. The hypostatic union of Christ's human nature with the divine logos took place at the moment of conception. This is a de fide dogma. The hypostatic union of Christ's human nature with the divine logos took place at the moment of conception. I think that lends support to the pro-life position that life begins at conception also. In opposition to the Catholic dogma is the originistic doctrine, according to which Christ's human soul pre-existed and already before the incarnation was united with the divine logos. Another erroneous view, the Gnostic, held that it was only on the occasion of his baptism that the Logos first descended on the man, on the man Jesus. The symbols of faith asserted, the symbols of faith assert the passive conception of the Son of God, not of the man Jesus, as would be correct if the hypostatic, if the hypostatic union of the two natures had occurred at a later point in time. The Apostles' Creed confesses. His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived of the Holy Ghost. The scriptures corroborate that the Son of God became man in that he was made, that is, was conceived and born of the, out of the race of David or out of a woman. Romans 1.3 talks about the gospel saying, quote, concerning his Son who was made to him of the seed of David according to the flesh, unquote. And Galatians 4.4 4, which says, quote, but when the fullness of time had come, God sent his Son, made of a woman, end quote. St. Augustine says, quote, From the moment in which he began to be man, he is also God, end quote. That from his work on the Trinity. St. Cyril of Alexandria teaches, quote, The God Logos from the moment of conception united with himself, the temple assumed of the Holy Virgin, that is to say the human nature, end quote. And he goes on to say, there never was, quote, there never was a mere man, Jesus, before the connection and unification of God with him, end quote. And the references are given there if you want to look that up. 
you can compare with St. Augustinus, is that St. Augustine? Contra Sermon Arian, against Arius. Mary's true divine motherhood demands that the conception of Jesus and the beginning of the hypostatic union should coincide in time. Two, duration of the hypostatic union. And here we have a dogma. A, the hypostatic union was never interrupted. This is a cent certa grade of certainty. The hypostatic union was never interrupted. He's still God and man up in heaven. He didn't unincarnate. The Apostles' Creed asserts of the Son of God that he suffered, was crucified, died, was buried, according to the body, and descended into hell, according to the soul. Christ's death dissolved the connection between body and soul. Christ was therefore, during the three days, not man. That is, a compositum of body and soul. See the symbol for that. But his death did not dissolve the attachment of Godhead and humanity. Or of their parts. Even after their separation, the body and the soul separately remained hypostatically united with the divine logos. Amazing. The teaching of the church is opposed by the Gnostic Manichaean teaching, according to which the logos left the man before the passion. The continuance of the hypostatic union during the passion also is proved by 1 Corinthians 2 8, which says, quote, If they had known the concealed wisdom of God, they would never have crucified the Lord of glory, meaning God, end quote. The passage relied on by the Gnostics is Matthew 27, 46, which says, My God, my God, quote, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me, end quote. Is acutely explained, oh, the passage relied on by the Gnostics is this, is acutely, okay, I see. The, pas the passage relied on by the Gnostics is Matthew 27, 46. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me is acutely explained by v Hugo of St. Victor, who died in 1141. He withdrew his protection, but he did not separate the union. That's what Saint, uh, Hugo of St. Victor says. Because of Matthew 27, 46, some fathers, like St. Ambrose and St. Hilary, wrongly thought that at Christ's death, the Godhead left the body. The conception of the fathers is expressed in the axiom. What the word once assumed, he never dismissed. In regard to the soul, this had an absolute validity. In regard to the body, only a relative one. And here we have another dogma. B. The hypostatic union will never cease. Is a defeat a dogma. The hypostatic union will never cease. In all eternity, Christ will have his body, human body, human soul, and human will. In addition to his divine nature and divine modes of operation, etc. The doctrine of Marcellus of Ancyra, who died about 374, according to which the incarnate Logos will, at the end of time, put off the human nature and revert to God, from whom he proceeded for the purpose of creating the world, was rejected as heresy by the Second General Council of Constantinople in 381. In opposition to it, an addition to the Synod of Faith was accepted, of whose kingdom there shall be no end. See Luke 133 and there are other references to Denzinger given there. Luke 133 bears witness to the uninterrupted continuance of the Hypostatic Union in the future saying, quote, And he shall reign in the house of Jacob forever and ever, and of his king kingdom there shall be no end. end quote. But Christ is king of the messianic realm as God-man. The letter to the Hebrews corroborates the eternal duration of Christ's priesthood, saying, quote, But this Christ, for that he continueth forever, hath an everlasting priesthood. But this, for that he continueth forever, hath an everlasting priesthood. I'm not sure that's not... The wording is a bit awkward for me. But this, for that he continueth forever, hath an everlasting priesthood. 
end quote. But Christ is a priest as God-man. The fathers reject the doctrine of Marcellus of Ancyra. St. Cyril of Jerusalem, for example, says, quote, If thou shouldest hear that Christ's empire has an end, then hate this heresy, end quote. The reference is given. And here we have an appendix, the precious blood of Jesus Christ. I actually belong to the confraternity of the precious blood of Jesus Christ. By the grace of God, I say prayers morning and night for that confraternity in union with the other members. Beautiful confraternity. At its origins in Quebec, here in Quebec, Canada, it moved to uh, New York. <clears throat> I think Brooklyn, to be precise. Back in the day. So here we have the appendix, the precious blood of Jesus Christ, and they're giving another dogma. The blood in the living body of Jesus Christ is an integral constitu constituent part of human nature, immediately, not merely, not merely immediately, united with the person of the divine Logos. This is a sent certa grade of certainty. The blood in the living body of Jesus Christ is an integral constituent part of human nature, immediately, not merely immediately, united with the person of the divine Logos. The fifth anathema, anathema of St. Cyril speaks of the unification of the Logos with flesh and blood. Verbum factum est caro et communicavit similiter ut nos carni et sanguini. The word was made flesh and like us had flesh and blood. According to the Jubilee Bull, Unigenitus Dei Filius, of Pope Clement VI, the value of the blood of Christ on account of its union with Logos is so great that one little drop would have sufficed for the redemption of the whole human race. As blood of the divine Logos, the blood of Jesus Christ is, quote, the precious blood, end quote. And uh, we have 1 Peter 1, 19 cited, the great price of our redemption. 1 Corinthians 6.20 And in the same manner as the body of Christ, nourishment for the supernatural life of the soul. See John 6.53 and following. In regard to the blood shed on the cross, the Sententia Communis now teaches that the blood, when and insofar as it was reassumed into the body on the resurrection, remained hypostatically united with the Logos even during the separation from the body. Fascinating. Chapter 4. I'm going to end here. But next time we'll talk about the theological speculative discussion on the hypostatic union, the supernatural and mysterious character of the hypostatic union. The hypostatic union as grace. Mm, exciting stuff. So that's it for today. I'm going to think I'm going to do any more, but maybe I will, maybe I'll do one more to finish off section one. I could do items 15 to 22, maybe I'll do that right now. So thanks for being here and we'll talk very shortly. Take care, God bless.